everyone, my name is Mark Moykins from Big Mountain Studio, and welcome to the third video in the Swift Memory Mastery series. If you haven't watched the other two videos, I recommend you go back and watch those now because we're going to build upon the knowledge that you learned from them. So in a previous video, we learned a little bit about automatic reference counting. We learned about finding memory problems using the uh, leaks instruments tool. And then we fix those memory problems using either weak references or unknown references. Now in this video, we're going to take that knowledge a little bit further. You're going to learn about closures. If you don't know what closures are right now, don't worry about it. I'll explain it and go into detail as far as what they are. And then we're going to look at how closures can cause memory problems. It's actually like one of the easiest ways to create a memory problem. And a lot of developers don't know this. So I'm going to show you some handy tips on how to fix those, how to find them and then how to fix them. Yeah, it looks like it's about it. Okay, I hope you guys enjoy this video. And yeah, that looks like it's about it. <laughs> okay, this is part three of the Swift Memory Mastery series. If you haven't seen part one or part two, then this content may be a little bit confusing because we're going to build off of that previous knowledge. So if you haven't watched those videos, please watch them first so you're not overwhelmed or confused by this video. All right, thanks. Before we begin, there's something you must know, and that is what a closure is. Now I know you've probably seen and even used closures without fully knowing what they are. Apple says that closures are self-contained blocks of functionality that can be passed around and used in your code. If you come from an Objective-C background, then this is similar to a block. In C Sharp and other languages, you might know them as lambdas or anonymous methods. So basically, it's a function with no name that can be passed around. So let's look at some examples. Here we probably see the most simple example of a closure. A closure, which is basically some code between braces, is assigned to a variable. But what can you do with this? Well, you can call it later on in your code somewhere, just like calling a function. You can also pass it into another function as a parameter if you want. So in this case, call some code accepts a parameter of a closure type, and we're just passing in our closure in here. And then call some code will execute that closure's code. Okay, so if closures are like functions without names, how do you pass in parameters or return a value? For example, let's look at this function. How could you create a closure that represents this function? Here we pass in a name and we return a string. Well, you still use the parentheses with the parameters defined inside followed by a return type, just like the function. Except in a closure, you separate the parameters and the return type from the rest of the code with the in keyword. In a previous series about reusable pop-ups, we assigned a closure to a class property. This closure will get called later on by the pop-up class. So why am I telling you all of this? This is a course about memory, right? What do closures have to do with memory? I'm teaching you about closures because there's one important fact that you have to understand, and that is that closures are reference types. That's right, a closure is its own object with its own address in memory. Much like a class has its own memory address, well, so does a closure. So in this example, this closure, this reference type, is being assigned to the onSave property, and it has its own address in memory. So what do you know about reference types? Well, there's only one copy in memory, and what actually gets passed around is just a pointer to that memory address. Okay, now I want to prove to you that closures are actually reference types. But let's go back into this project that I created to demonstrate reusable pop-ups. Okay, so what's happening in this view controller is there's a UI with a button on it, and when I click the button, it's going to navigate to a date pop-up view controller, which you see right here. We assign some values to the properties on the pop-up, including the on save right here. We assign a closure to the on save property. So let's go take a look at this pop-up here. I'm going to hold down command and right click on it. It's going to navigate to date pop-up view controller. And I have a breakpoint set right here. So when we come into the view dude load, we're going to stop and we're going to check out the memory of this class here. So let me just run it. Okay, where this class is is actually on the second tab here. 
when I click navigate away. And it's when I click this button that we're going to go into the pop-up view controller and hit our breakpoint. Okay, now we hit our breakpoint. And I want to look at these properties on self, which is the pop-up. And this is the one I'm particularly interested in, is the on save. So notice the on save, which has our closure assigned to it, has its own memory address right here. And there's another message that goes along with it. Reusable pop-ups, partial, apply, forwarder, foreclosure, number one. <laughs> I actually, I don't even know what that means. I tried looking it up on the internet, but I wasn't able to find any good answers as to what that actually means. So if any of you guys figure out what it means, please leave a comment below and teach me because I had a hard time finding the answer. But the main thing I want to show you here though is that the on save, our closure, has its own memory address. Okay, good. Now you know that closures are reference types and as a reference type, they have their own memory address and there's only one in memory and whenever you pass it around, you're passing around a pointer to it. So as a reference type, they can also create their own memory problems. It is especially easy to create retain cycles with closures. And as we continue, I'll show you how this happens. But first, notice that inside this closure, we are referencing this view controller's date label. Now let's see what this dependency chain might look like if we create a memory graph, starting with the date pop-up view controller all the way to this date label. Starting with the date pop-up view controller at the top, it has a property called onSave, which is a closure. And notice I created a separate object for the onSave because it is its own object. It has its own memory address. And then inside of that closure, onSave references the view controller, which is represented by the word self, and it references self so we can access the date label because we want to set some text on that date label. Okay, let's take a look at these arrows here. And we notice the date pop-up view controller has a strong reference to the onSave and inside of that on save closure, it has a strong reference to the view controller, which has the label. And the label itself is a weak reference because if we look at the code, notice it has the word weak there. And usually when you create outlets inside of view controllers, they're almost always weak. I don't know if I've ever seen an outlet that wasn't weak. Maybe it can happen, but I really haven't investigated it, so I'm not sure, but I'm pretty certain that most of the time, they're always weak references. Okay, now I mentioned before that closures can cause memory problems, so let's see how this can happen. Now what I've done here is I've changed the code to introduce a problem. We now have a new property at the top called popup. So what's the problem with this, you might ask? This will create a retain cycle. As we saw previously, the popup has a strong reference to the onSave closure, right? Well, the onSave closure has a strong reference to the view controller, as we can see with the self keyword inside the closure here. And now this view controller has a strong reference back to the pop-up. The memory graph has changed, so let's take a look at what it looks like now. As you can see now, we have a nice little circle going around and around because now that view controller, which is inside the closure, has a reference back to the pop-up, which is a strong reference. And because of this, we will have orphaned objects in memory, also known as a memory leak. Swift can't remove the date pop-up view controller, and it can't remove the view controller because they both point to each other. And because they both point to each other, they will have a reference count that can never get to zero. And so Swift can't remove them. So how are we going to fix this problem? Well, let me ask you something first. If the closure is its own object, how come we didn't have to pass in self as a parameter? Or how come we didn't have to pass it in as an argument, like in a constructor, the way other classes work? How is this view controller actually getting into that object, the closure? The answer is what is known as capturing values. Capturing values, what does that mean? Let's try to understand this concept. Swift calls capturing. We need to know this because this is what's going to lead to the solution that will enable us to resolve the memory problem. In Swift documentation, it says a nested function can capture any of its outer functions arguments and can also capture any of its constants and variables defined within the outer function. Okay, that's a lot to take in. So what's a nested function and what's an outer function? Well, let's look at an example, see if we can sort this out. Okay, we have another example here of a closure that is capturing the values around it. The UI view animates trailing closure in this example 
is the nested function. It's basically a function that's inside another function. The do animation is the outer function. So let's look at that statement again about capturing values. A nested function, which is the animates closure, can capture any of its outer functions. The do animation is the outer function, can capture any of its arguments, and can also capture any constants and variables defined within the outer function, the do animation. Okay, now I want to direct your attention to something here. Notice in the UI view animates function or closure, it checks show label if show label. So notice that the animates closure doesn't need self to reference the argument show label, but it does need self to reference the label because it cannot capture my label without the self reference. It can capture self, but not the view controller's members outside of the outer function. So that's capturing. We don't have to pass in variables like arguments into nested functions. We can just access them from the outer function. It's also important to note that by default, a closure captures values with a strong reference to those values. If you're not sure what I mean by strong reference, then you have to please watch the previous video. The next question is, can you pass in your own values into a closure? The answer is yes. In Swift, you can do this with a capture list. Here's a basic syntax with some examples. The brackets indicate that the capture list is actually an array. So you can pass in multiple variables into your closure. As you can see, you declared the variables normally. We can instantiate value types as in the first example, or instantiate reference types as in the second example. So in our code, we can do something like this. Here, I create a label that represents self.myLabel. Okay, let's go into Xcode so you can see what it actually looks like. Okay, we're in Xcode, and this is just like the code example that we had before. We're gonna create a capture list. Okay, and I'm going to create a label variable to represent self.myLabel. And then inside this closure, I can just replace self.myLabel with label. Okay, just like that. Okay, so you now know that you can use a capture list to create variables and pass them into your closure, but there's one more thing you can do, and that is you can change the strength of the variable in the capture list. By default, variables coming in through the capture list are a strong reference. Even if the variable is declared as weak, such as this label, it doesn't matter. Once it comes in through the capture list, it'll be a strong reference. You can change this by using weak or unowned right in the capture list. And this is actually how you'll be fixing many retain cycles with this method right here. Let's look at the next example. I create a variable VC to represent the view controller, which is self. And this is totally fine doing it this way. But there's another way that you can write this in capture list too. Instead, we can just change the strength of the reference with unowned or weak through the capture list like this. And if you're unsure of like what weak and unowned mean here, then what you want to do is go back and watch the previous video, part two, where I describe strong, weak, and unowned. Basically, the reason why I'm using unowned here is because I believe that self won't be nil when I get it. Okay, now here we have the most common usage of the capture list. We use it to pass in and change the reference strength of one of our captured variables from a strong reference to an unowned reference. So using weak or unowned will break the retain cycle and will allow the pop-up and this view controller here to release themselves from memory. So let's look at the memory graph here. As you can see, inside the capture list on the on save, it's now an unowned reference and it breaks that cycle going around and around. So at this point, you might be wondering, should I always use a capture list when using a closure? Uh, you don't have to unless you have a retain cycle that you need to break. Capture lists do come with a little bit of overhead. Known performs slightly better than a weak reference, but you'll probably never even notice it in most of your apps. Okay, great. With the knowledge you've gained from this series on memory, you're now better equipped to see if you have retain cycles in your apps. And then how to fix them using a capture list if necessary.
In the next video, we're going to go back to the reusable pop-ups project. I showed you three different ways of passing data back and forth. Each of those ways can create memory problems. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to create some memory problems and we're going to fix them too. So subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can get notified when that next video comes out because we're going to go back into Xcode and we're going to apply this knowledge that you learned from these three videos. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to share it with your friends on social media. And if you'd like to help out, you can also supply a translation to the title and the description. All right, thanks guys.